بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبع. All right, let's begin. We started. It. It's all good. Okay. All right. So we left off at section seven, and we are continuing from here. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. By the way, who remembers what surah we're on? Ali Imran. Who remembers what Ali Imran means? Family of Imran. Family of Imran. Who remembers who is Imran? The father of Mary. Father of Maryam. Very good. All right. Verse 64. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Says, <coughs> say, saying to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, people of the book, let's come to common terms between us. So the Prophet's being told to tell the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Ahlul الْكِتَابِ Jews and Christians. Jews and Christians. Okay. Because they're called people of the book because they have a book that came from Prophet Musa, a book that came from Prophet Isa. Even though it's been slightly modified, they still have a book. So they're known as people of the book. So the Prophet is being told to say, let's come to common terms that we can agree to. What is that? By the way, before we get to that, you know, whenever you're discussing with somebody, and you get into an argument with somebody. Sometimes discussions, arguments, it's hard to know which one is which. What ends up happening is if you can't if you can't get through to the person you're trying to explain some message to them, one of the strategies to do or to utilize is to say, okay, let's start on some common ground. What are the things we both agree upon? Right? Like nowadays there's a lot of discussions about what's happening in Palestine and Gaza. You're discussing with someone and they don't see eye to eye with you at least you try to come to some common ground. What can we agree upon? Can we agree that, you know, innocent lives are sacred and people should not, innocent people should not be killed? Can we at least start on that, right? So when you're discussing with someone and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, it's okay, let's take a step back. Let's establish some basic, fundamental common ground between us. This is exactly what Allah is telling the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to say to the Jews and the Christians. Let's come to some common terms. Number one. Allah na'abuda illa Allah wa la nushrika bihi shay'an wa la yattakhidha ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah. Number one, that we only worship Allah. Number two, we do not group anyone with him. We do not group anyone with Allah, like in worship or authority or superiority. And number three, nor do we take one another as lords besides Allah. So basically, the Prophet is being told that, you know what? Three things. Let's agree upon these common three terms that we have. You know, that we you should be believing in these three things as well. Now, you might say, okay, well, wait a minute. Um, why, why would the Jews and Christians agree upon these things? Because they're mentioned in their books. So if you look in their books, they have the exact same three things. That are telling them to for these three fundamental principles. So that's very important. So let's take a look at where. For example, with the Christians. The is biggest issue on this particular point is comes back to the Christians. Uh, about worshipping Jesus and things like that. So if we go to the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 4 verse 10. Jesus says. And this is in the book of the Christians. Jesus says. You shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall only serve him. And he's telling other people this. But what's interesting is that Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting from the Torah. And he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Which is so interesting because this is now addressing both religions at the same time. The people of the book, Ahlul Kitab. So they already have this. And what ends up happening is that historically... The Christians started worshipping Jesus, number one. Number two, they started worshipping saints. So, for example, if you go around and you look at uh, what is like, you will find the word saint everywhere. For example, Valentine's Day is in like February or something like that. Who is Valentine? Saint Valentine. It's actually Saint Valentine. He's a saint, right? There's Saint uh Nicholas. There's Saint uh you know there's like dozens of saints. Does anyone know in the name of any other saints? 
Saint Peter's, but there's just so so Saint Augustine. There's so many saints, and what happens is these are people who are considered to be special in Christianity, and they were regarded to be someone who like served the cause of Christianity. But then they became venerated, and people would basically like have pictures of them, have statues of them. They would make an entire day. So, for example, Saint like Valentine's Day is Saint Valentine's Day. Why is it Saint Valentine's Day? Because the Christian Church decided that you know what, this was a person that we value in Christianity, and we're going to go ahead and dedicate an entire day to the saint, and we're going to be praying, and we're going to be praying on the day of this saint when he died or something like that. And they just pick up, you know, random uh, days. So there was not only worship of Jesus, there was worship of saints and there was worship of relics and different items and things like that. So here, Islam is calling people to come back and say, don't worship any of these things. Don't even have such a venerance, such a veneration for people that we're almost gets to the level of worshiping them. But we should only worship Allah not group anyone else with Allah and give anyone that status and not take anyone else as lords besides Allah. So there was a Christian by the name of Adi ibn Hatim. He was an Arab Christian during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he accepted Islam. He became Muslim and he used to wear like a golden cross around his neck. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, he's like, now that you're Muslim, you need to stop wearing, you can't be wearing a cross anymore. You know, maybe he just thought, oh, it just looks nice, it looks cool. But for a Muslim, it doesn't matter if it looks cool. What does the cross signify? So you should, yeah, you're not supposed to be wearing that, right? So anything which signifies something that's against Islam, you may think it looks cool, like some Halloween costume or something like that. But if it's against the teachings of Islam, you don't wear that thing. So Adi ibn Hatim, he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and now that he's Christian, now that he's Muslim, and he's not wearing the cross anymore and everything. He came to the Prophet and he said, you know what? I've been reading the Quran and I've been listening, I've been listening to the Quran. And one thing doesn't make sense to me. I think this verse specifically right here, then there's a few other verses. It never made sense to me that says, Don't take any other lords besides Allah. And he says, But we I was Christian. He said, We didn't take other lords besides Allah. Like, yeah, we worship Jesus. That's I was wrong. Uh, but we didn't take other people as like being our you know our religious leaders and stuff we didn't take them as like worshiping them so what did the prophet peace be upon him say he said what happened was is that the christians whatever their leaders and their saints and their popes and their priests whatever they would say is halal they would make it halal whatever they would say is haram they would make it haram and he says because if you decide that whatever this person says becomes halal or haram, they get to decide what it is, not Allah. You've taken that person as like being your God. You've taken that person as being someone equivalent to Allah. So he's saying that's exactly what they had done. And if you look at it, until today, the Catholic Church, the Pope, gets to decide. And in the Orthodox Church, the Pope gets to decide what is halal and what is haram. They can decide whatever whatever is uh, accepted, what is allowed. So, for example, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, or 20 years ago, a man marrying a man was 100% forbidden and prohibited. And now, lately, the Pope had a recent statement about how, you know, it's not so bad anymore. It just, one thing was haram, and now it's like, well, you know, it's kind of getting to the borderline of becoming halal. In the uh, Mormon church, th there's another sect of Christianity in America called the Mormon church. They also have their, like, Pope. The prophet, they call him a prophet. They used, he used to say, the, the original founders of Mormon church, they used to say, African Americans, black people, are not allowed in the church. They're not allowed. They're, they cannot become Mormons. They cannot, they cannot join our religion. They just simply are not allowed. And then, about 40 years ago or something like that, they changed and they said, now it's halal for black people to join the church. So they, it's just simply a change. So when you go and you make a decision and you say, you know what? There is someone who's going to decide, not Allah, 
It's going to be a human being who's going to decide what is halal, what is haram, and they can switch anything whenever they want and you have to follow it. That is exactly taking other people as lords besides Allah. And if you look at the doctrine of the Orthodox Christian Church today, it actually says in this, and I'll read to you the quote. It says, without this visible church, there is no salvation. It is under the abiding influence of the Holy Ghost, which is one part of the Trinity, and therefore cannot err in the matters of faith. So basically saying the church can never, ever be wrong. Whatever they say, if it's halal, it's halal. Even if it was haram, it becomes halal. And if they say something is haram, it becomes haram. So that is exactly what it means. But this is only Allah's role. Only Allah can decide what people should do and what they should follow in terms of the clear-cut rules that are there. If you take anybody else and you give them that role, you're giving them the role of Allah, which is the role of the Lord. So this is exactly what it says when you say, we do not take anybody else as lords besides Allah. If they turn away, meaning if they reject this basic idea of agreeing upon these three basic principles, then you should say, the Muslims, you should say, be witness that we have submitted. We are Muslims. So the word is, be, be witness that we are Muslim. But remember, what does the word Muslim actually mean in language? Who remembers? Who raise your hand? Who remembers what the word Muslim itself actually means? Anybody else besides Jabin? <laughs> Yusuf. A submitter or surrender. Very good. Exactly. Somebody who submits or somebody who surrenders themselves. So it says we have submitted to Allah alone. This is what we are. We are Muslims. Because if you can't even agree on the three fundamental principles, what's the rest of the discussion? It's just like today, for example, on Palestine. If you're talking to somebody and you say, can we at least say the life of an innocent Israeli Jew is equal to the life of an innocent Palestinian Muslim or Christian? And they say, no. What's the point? There's no there's nothing to discuss, right? So the exact same thing Allah is saying, if they can't agree on these three basic fundamental principles, just say, you know what? Well, we're Muslim. And what that means is we're the ones who are following the true religion that God has sent down. Because this is the true religion. Whatever else you've added or modified, that is not the true religion. Next verse. Allah says, Ya ahlal kitab lima tuhad. People of the book, why do you argue about Abraham, about Prophet Ibrahim, while the Torah and the gospel were not revealed until long after him? So what does it mean arguing about Ibrahim? So the Jews are saying that Ibrahim was a Jew, meaning he followed Judaism. And the Christians are saying, no, he, he's with us. He follows Christianity. And they're saying, why are you arguing about Prophet Ibrahim? Prophet Ibrahim lived centuries before Prophet Musa came. He lived centuries before Prophet Isa came. He lived hundreds and hundreds of years, over a thousand years before any of these prophets came. And there were no terms of Judaism. There was no term of Christianity that even existed during the time of Prophet Ibrahim. So how can you say, oh, Prophet Ibrahim, he's he's with us. He can't be with you. The, the, the religion that you're claiming to follow, even just the word, the name itself, Christianity did not exist during the time of Prophet Ibrahim. Judaism did not exist during the time of Prophet Ibrahim because the word Jude, where does Christianity come from? Where does the word Christianity come from? Who knows? Raise your hand. Jabra, I'll let you have this one. Okay, yeah, Christ. Christ. The word Jesus, Christ. And Christ means Messiah, means the, the chosen one. Where did the word Judaism come from? You can tell me, raise your hand if you know. Only Jabra? Go ahead, Jabra. The Mount of Judah. Okay. Mount of Judah. So the tribe of Judah, and they lived in the region of Judea. Yes, exactly. So it came from a region, and then it became a tribe. That tribe only existed after Prophet Ibrahim. So the term didn't even exist. It's not even there. Okay. Uh, is it connected to this? Yeah. But we had no idea where the mountain of Judah is. Uh, you're talking about Judea from Prophet Nur. That's yeah, different. Oh, That's Mount oh, yeah. Judea. Yeah. So talking about a region of Judea. So Jews, tribe of Judah. So 
No, it's somewhere around that area. Yes. So this tribe of Judah only existed after Prophet Ibrahim's time. So how can you how can you claim that Prophet Ibrahim is there? So this doesn't make sense. So don't make this argument because Prophet Ibrahim lived centuries earlier. He couldn't have been on Judaism or Christianity, right? So what was he on? We're going to find out. Afala so, ta'aqilun. Why can't you understand? Like why can't you think properly? This this doesn't this doesn't make sense what you're saying. So now Allah is going to tell us what was Prophet Ibrahim. What what actually was he? Here you are. You argued about what you have some knowledge about in the Torah and the gospel in your books. You guys have a little bit of knowledge about Prophet Ibrahim. Prophet Ibrahim is mentioned in both books. But then Allah says, yeah, you have some of that knowledge. But why are you now arguing about what you have no knowledge about? You're arguing about the terms that Prophet Ibrahim used. Like what, what did he define himself as? What was his religion when he was speaking to his own people? You see, you guys are arguing about this. It definitely wasn't Christianity. He didn't go around to his father and say, you know what, dad, you should become a Christian. There's no way he could have done that, right? We know a little bit about the story of Prophet Ibrahim. He went to his father. His father was worshipping idols. He told his father, stop worshipping idols. Do you think he went to his father and said, Dad, you should follow Judaism? Impossible. There's no way that could happen. So Allah is saying, why are you going and making these claims when it doesn't even make sense to do so? Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you do not know. So Allah is going to tell you. It's true. ما كان إبراهيم يهوديا ولا نصرانيا ولكن كان حنيفا مسلما. Ibrahim was neither a Jew nor a Christian. He was an upright Muslim. And I put Muslim in lowercase. Muslim. Yeah. He was a Muslim, but what does Muslim mean? Somebody who surrenders or submits themselves to Allah, to God. So Allah is using both words here. He's saying he was a Muslim. What does the word Muslim or what does the word Islam mean? It means surrender. What does the word Christianity mean? A follower of Jesus Christ. He couldn't have been that. What does the word Judaism mean? Judaism means follower of someone coming from the tribe of Judah and following that religion. He couldn't have been that. So what was his religion closest to? The religion of Islam. He, the Prophet Ibrahim, it makes more sense to call him a Muslim. So it's talking about these terms. He was not an idol worshiper. So he wasn't one of those either, in case someone tries to make some kind of claim to that. Those who have best claim to Abraham are his followers. First of all, the ones who lived during his time and they followed him. They have the most rightful claim to say, I follow the true religion and true teachings of Prophet Ibrahim. This Prophet, meaning the Prophet Muhammad, and the believers. The believers who live with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it's basically saying that, you know what? What does Islam teach? Islam teaches that all the Prophets came with a similar message. Only worship Allah. Don't associate any other partners with Allah. That was exactly what Prophet Ibrahim was teaching. So he's saying that people who truly follow Prophet Ibrahim, they have a greater claim to say that we're on the religion of Ibrahim. And what's interesting is if you go back and you look and you say, what exactly was Ibrahim doing? You know, how was he praying? How was he speaking? How was he talking? Who's closer to that? The Jews, the Christians, or the Muslims? You analyze it and you'll see that the Muslims are the closest to Prophet Ibrahim. And, and everyone can see that. It's very clear for anyone who understands that. Wallahu waliyul mu'mineen. Allah is the guardian of those who believe. And Allah will protect those people from whatever uh, you know problems that they may face because of this teaching. And then Allah says, Some of the people of the book, they want to mislead you. Right, meaning the believers, they don't even want you to be guided. Now, the, here's the problem the problem is the people of the book they have their religion, right? And there's a group of them, they would rather have the Muslims go back to worship because remember, the, the 
uh, the Muslims during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, most of them were coming from worshipping idols. And they stopped worshipping idols. But saying this, a group of people of the book, they would rather you go back to worshipping idols than you remain as you are as Muslims. Because, you know, even though it's further from their religion, because of they have some problem in their heart, because they have this hatred towards towards you, and they can't even see you to even be close to them. They'd rather you be further away because then that'll help their argument for their own religion. They only mislead themselves, but they don't even realize. They don't even understand. So they're trying to misguide the believers, but actually they're misguiding themselves. You know why they're misguiding themselves? Because it doesn't make sense. If somebody is somebody's this far from your religion, this is let's say this is your religion. Somebody's this far away from you, and then their religion comes a little bit closer to you like this, and you're getting upset, and you're like, why are you kind of getting close to my religion? Get back. Get back. You should be further away from the truth. Go back to worshiping idols. You're like, you're just, you're deceiving yourself. Why would you want something like that for somebody else? That doesn't even make any sense. Verse 7. Ya ahlal kitab lima takfuruna bi ayatillahi wa antum tashhadun. People of the book, why do you reject the revelation of Allah while you are witnesses? Witnesses meaning you can see the signs of Prophet Muhammad's coming in your own books. There, we, we've discussed this before. There are signs that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is going to come. Signs in the Torah, signs in the Injil. But it's saying you, you witness this and still you're rejecting these signs. Then Allah says, Ya ahlal kitab lima talbisun al haqqa bil baatili wa taktumun al haqqa wa antum ta'lamun. People of the book, why are you mixing the truth with falsehood? So what were they doing? They were twisting around the text that they had and they would modify the words so that people could not recognize that it was referring to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And you hide the truth knowingly. Right? So what were they doing? They were pretending like those texts don't even exist. It's like, what are you talking about? I don't know which book you're talking about. So you, there's, there's a Mention in your book, say Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, very easy one to remember, and it talks about the prophecy of a prophet coming. Wait, wait, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, And they would hide those scrolls and they wouldn't present it to somebody else. Or they'll go and they'll like make some modifications. Say, no, that's not talking about that. Talking about something else. So they're going and hiding all these things. And here's the problem. Which one of these two is worse? Mixing truth with falsehood? Or hiding something that you know is true. Which one is more dangerous? I'll say both. Mixing truth with falsehood. Ali thinks mixing truth with falsehood. Anyone else? Mixing? Yeah. Mixing. Mixing the truth with falsehood is, is the worst. You know why it's the worst? Because imagine you tell somebody. Have you ever heard this before? It's called like two truths and a lie. Right? Yeah. So imagine this. Imagine somebody goes nine truths, nine truths and a lie. And they come and they start telling you a story about somebody else and say, you know, his brother Ali, you know what he did? He's, he, he walked outside the masjid and he walked in the back of the parking lot. And let's say, that's true. And you say, you know what happened afterwards? None of you know it. After he walked in the back of the parking lot, then he started drinking some water. Okay. And that's true too. And then all of a sudden he started drinking some water. Then... He threw the water on some other kid. <laughs> and, then, and, and then, and then, you know what he did? He felt really sorry. And he said sorry to the kid. And he hugged him, you know. And he came back into the masjid and he made toba. And let's say, let's say all the other ones like are true. But the, there's one false thing in there. How can you how can you recognize which one is false? He dumped the water on the kid. You, you, you believe so much of that story because every, you're like, wow, I didn't even know he like left. I didn't know he went in the back. But and what happens is this exact this is exactly how people who want to spread gossip, this is how they spread their gossip. They don't just come with a lie. They're gonna come with nine truths and mix in one lie in between, and you're like, Well, I checked this one, it was true. And I checked this one, it was true too, and I checked this one, it was true. And I didn't, I didn't know all this information, but they slipped one lie in there. And what now you start to question and you go, now nah, I don't, I don't even know. What if the other true ones were false? What if the false one was true? I don't even know anymore. And you're completely confused. And this is the best way to manipulate people. 
And this is exactly what the media does. This is what people who like to gossip do. It's exactly what happens. And this is what the people of the book were doing when it came to the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's very confusing for people. So I'll open it up to questions. Inshallah. In the back. But just to clarify, Ali did not do any of those. Just, just clarify. Yeah. Go ahead. Muslims should not bring candies to Valentine's Day to pass it out for two reasons. Number one, it's a Christian day called Saint Valentine's Day. And number two, you pass out candy usually because you're encouraged to like give it to a girl or something like that. That falls in the category of inappropriate, you know, cross gender relationships. So you should not do that in general. Yeah, you should try to avoid it and opt out as much as you can. Is it kind of a bad deed for, for the people who are trying to misguide, but a good deed for whom? Always hurt hearing the lie, but then resisting and saying, No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be misguided. Absolutely. Yes, you're right. Every time somebody is tempted to do something wrong and then they resist and they say, Nope, I'm not gonna do that, they get a good deed for that. Very good, Isa. That's actually hadith. Yes, Yusuf. Was the story of a planned out before? Ah, good question. Was the story of Ali planned out in advance? Is it no? I came up with it on the spot, and that's why it wasn't as good of a story. I could have come up with something much better. Yes, <laughs> yes, a jabber. Okay, that's question. So you were saying about you know, uh, the Christians are putting in their doctrines that uh, you know, this is halal, this is harm. Isn't this kind of what governments do? They kind of, they kind of were like, oh, uh, we allow this to be there, but we don't allow this. Are they kind of, are they like, like doing shit, like you know? Like no, so governments are making rules in general. They're making rules for how to control society and regulate society. They're not making rules for how you worship and what you eat and those type of things. So it's it's, it's in a different category. Inshallah. All right, so we'll leave it at that. Allahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Enjoy the next.